So um, yeah, um, one of the things I wanted to get to is uh, a, a couple of weeks ago, we got a message from the DeForest Public Library and they're seeking uh, someone from Madison Ast Astronomical Society to do a presentation about winter stargazing. So yeah, the librarian is looking for a member from MAS to give a public presentation uh, that's kind of brief and would be a how-to about stargazing and observing and close locations ideal for uh, observing, um, you know, I suppose in the DeForest Madison area. Also such a presentation might discuss seasonal constellations and any upcoming astronomical events. So, uh, and the target audience for this would be older adults and seniors. So um, I just wanted to, just in case anybody was interested in uh, uh, participating in that, maybe doing a presentation. Uh, yeah, this is David Lightpart here. I had replied back. I'm in, yeah. a, I, yeah. I'm in the DeForest area and know all the good locations around here. Yeah, I got got the list and yeah, I'll, I'll definitely, if no one, if you know, I just figured I'd get a list of everyone who was interested in participating. So yeah, I got you. I'll have you on my list. Thanks. Thank you so much, David. So that goes along perfectly with what I'm going to be talking about tonight. Absolutely. So <laughs> it fits in exactly with what, you know, we do at Space Place. All right. So I guess if there's no further discussion on that, secondly, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, quite a few weeks ago, about the time when we were uh, handling all the business with upgrades to YRS, um, uh, John Heasley sent me an email discussing about uh, the Kickapoo Valley Reserve in the Mississippi Valley Conservancy having their lands in that area designated as an international dark sky park. And he's interested in trying to get, uh, you know, a, a collaborated letter together to send on behalf of MAS and to just and to discuss with them you know the importance of having a dark sky destination within the driving distance of this area so um I'm just interested to see if anyone would be it would like to work on that project or or hear a little bit more from John about what this entails oh John do you want to say anything about that so this would be uh, Wisconsin's next dark sky park. There's already one at uh, Newport on the tip of Door County, and it combines Wildcat <coughs> Mountain State Park, Kickapoo Valley Reserve, and some land managed by uh, Mississippi Valley Conservancy at, at, at Tunnelville. But where Madison Astronomical can help is by writing a letter of support explaining why having areas such as this would be important to a, to a club if you're willing to travel about an hour or so to get there. And then also a standing invitation to come out to Vernon County and enjoy the dark skies. When it's a little warmer, but yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I think, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was just wondering, uh, John, do you have any, um, any, I hate to say the word form letter, but do you have any points that should be covered in a letter like that? Uh, um, any typical letters that other people have sent just to use as a some sort of a um, guide uh, to writing a letter like that? It's been some time, but my memory is when I emailed Lawrence that I did include uh, possible talking points, and okay. I could include I could include um, sample letters that we have that we have that we have received. But I know what you're talking about. Yeah, those letters are a whole lot easier to write when you've got a model and when it's already partially in place. So a good reminder, Jurgen. I'd be willing to take it to, to work on that if other people are also, uh, Lawrence. I yeah, great. Will. Oh, yeah. Oh, I can Dick. help you, Jurgen. I, I would also be willing to help. I had a, I spent a couple nights camping out there and it was absolutely brought my scope along and it was really fantastic. Like, so... Yeah, it'd be it'd be good to have you know multiple names, uh, you know, signed to it, you know, including you know yeah. people, especially us avid observers or us avid uh, astrophotographers like Bob Hamer's. There, it'd be great. To, it'd be great to have some signatures on there. 
John, is this if if this a letter like this is written, how do you want signatures handled? Do you want lots of signatures of members, or do you want this to be something that comes from the board, or how? Or what's the probably the best way to do this? I was originally seeing it as just coming from Madison Astronomical Society, whoever whoever would best represent you on the on the board. I would be fine seeing lots of signatures on it if you're willing to take on that extra work. I think that would be even more effective. Especially for those of us who happen to have office scanners. Yeah. And, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, John, I, when, when do you need this letter? Yeah, the time frame. Uh, not right away, but if we've got momentum right now, I always come back and ask, what's a good time frame for getting this done? A week, a month? Probably, Jan I'd assume by January at the earliest yeah. okay. with the holidays coming up. Okay, that sounds good. Uh, I already contacted Lawrence, but who would be a good contact person then for MAS? Jurgen? Lawrence, is that okay if I take it? Yeah, yeah, Jurgen, go ahead. And if, if you and, want to copy on any other folks that'd like to participate. Yeah. like. And I didn't write down who else was volunteering, but if you could send me an all of you have my email address, I think. And just go ahead and send me an email saying you'd like to work on this. And Lawrence, if you could forward any of that stuff that John sent you, that'd be great. I'll do, I'll do that when I get my hands free. Great. Well, okay, great. You need your hands free to do that? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Siri, Siri John, won't do it for you? <laughs> I'm, I'm also wondering if, um, you know, I'll talk to Jim about this and see if Space Place can be another, you know, supporter of that. Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks. You know, maybe maybe a space place could write their own letter. I mean, the more letters. Yeah, exactly. Better. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you very much, Jim. Thank you very much. Jim Lattice sent us a letter back way back in the spring, in the springtime. Oh, so I, you have one from him already? I asked him and I got the letter pretty much the next day. So he's like that. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> That's unusual, but okay. <laughs> He was right on it, and he's got a long history with Kickapoo Valley Reserve, so that that meant an awful lot to have his to have his support. Okay, so. good. You know, if, Jurgen, if, I'll be in if, touch. If, I'm sorry, Jurgen, I'll be in touch. And Lawrence, okay. can take one thing off your list. I will just forward to Jurgen what I sent to you. So all right, check that one off. Okay. Thank and you so long, much, John. As long as we have everybody here, I think Rob, uh, Bob Hammer said he would. Chris said, and yep. who else was it? Dick. Uh, Dick Weibel. Anybody I'd else? be willing to I'd be willing to participate. That's Neil. Thanks, Neil. Great. Okay. All Thanks right. A of, that's a gang of five we have going. Sweet. Thank you. Thanks. And yeah, I'll, I'll sign off on I'll I'll sign my hang John Hancock on that too. All right. Um, also, I'm kind of dovetailing with our previous discussion about. Can, uh, Lawrence, yes. Lawrence, can I can I just say. I, I think when we write the letter, we'd probably pass it by the board, and then the board can sign off with Lawrence's signature, and then we can have a lot of other people signing addition as Lawrence. That's, I think that sounds like a real good idea. All right. I have a question for John. Uh, John, have you approached anybody at the UW Astronomy Department about uh, them chiming in? No. No, I guess the closest is Jim Lattice, who's representing the University in the Park program. No. Um, did, you have some, did you have somebody in mind? Not somebody specifically, no, but um, Lawrence or, or John uh, um, Rommel uh, have, uh, have had, we've had various uh, UW astronomy uh, department people uh, present here at MAS, and we could perhaps ask some of them if they could give us a um, suggestion of who to contact to uh, get a get a third letter from uh, from the area here on the behalf of uh, UW Astronomy. You know, there is there is Will, the undergrad. I don't he, I don't know if he's on the meeting, right? But he's an undergrad in in astrophysics, and he's pretty active in the in the group. I haven't seen him lately, but yeah, he might be able to get us a contact. Yeah. There is also the, we, we've had somebody talk from the UW astro uh, students, and I think there is a student astronomy club there, so there must be some way of yeah. handling that through the department. I can, I can talk to Jim about this. 
and see who might be a good person to contact. Um, Eric Wilcotts, who, um, uh, well, he started Universe in the Park programs, or not started, but ran Universe in the Park programs for a long time. And he's now, I forget what, with high up in letters and sciences. Yes, yeah, so he's waiting getting a letter from him. I know he's really busy and I know he's involved in a lot of things, but you know, maybe getting a letter from him would be, would be great. Unfortunately, as, as many of you guys know, it's pretty rare to find a professional astronomer who has even looked up at the sky in the last <laughs> decade. <laughs> <laughs> Most of them can't find the Big Dipper. <laughs> <laughs> Another idea might be uh, students at Madison Memorial with the planetarium being there. Um, you could get like a petition or something started with them. Those you know, are it, would, Thank you. It, it wouldn't hurt to approach Eric Wilcott. So I know him pretty well. And he's a good guy. He's great. He's, great. he's very much into like outreach and so. I would appreciate I would appreciate the help. Thank you very much. That would be a, that would be great support. I could probably approach Eric if you need someone to approach him. It's always it's always better when there is that personal that personal contact. So yeah. yes, please go ahead. So I'll get that information to you. All right, great discussion, everyone. Um, another thing, uh, kind of, you know, earlier we were talking about the upcoming. Uh, uh, we norm normally have our solstice at banquet and uh, not banquet solstice celebration and telescope clinic. And that's coming up for our next December meeting. But lately, there's been some discussion within the board about po the possibility of returning to in-person meetings at some time. And I know, you know, it's kind of confusing watching the news and reading uh, news reports lately because, you know, you, some areas of the country are, are making progress and other areas. It's just like tonight, I heard that in Colorado, some of the hospitals there are kind of maxed out right now. So I just, we were kind of wanting to get a feel from every, you know, all the members that were here, you know, kind of what their feelings would be as far as a target or a, kind of a threshold to cross where we feel comfortable returning to in-person meetings? It, well, yeah. well, right now, the, the latest news that I've heard is that we're in Wisconsin, part of the uh, up, upslope, you know, it looks like another wave may be coming on. We're not sure how big it'll be. And in Dane County, we may not be, we may be better off than some other places, but still uh, it doesn't look like it's going to really let up very soon. And, uh, and it would depend on the size of the gathering. But, uh, uh, and if you don't know what that's going to be, I think some people, I know I would be a bit reluctant to come back. And just this last Tuesday, John gave a presentation at Space Place. Um, did you want to, John, did you, John Rummel, did you want to uh, discuss any of your impressions from uh, that presentation? Uh, sure. First, uh, just editorializing. Back in August, we were on the verge of going back in person. In fact, Lawrence, I think you had made the announcement that we were going to go back in person. And that's when the Delta strain exploded. And I'm pretty sure we were responsible for that. If we hadn't talked about going back to in-person meetings, I don't think Delta ever would have happened. <laughs> this week, Lawrence emailed me the other day and asked me about my presentation at Space Place. And then when I, like you, I saw on the news that our numbers are starting to go up last night. So I th again, I think Lawrence caused that. Every time Lawrence <laughs> talks about going back to in-person, Wisconsin's numbers just go up. <laughs> Don't worry, it's not Lawrence. Your hawk. It's a favorite uh, <laughs> strategy. <laughs> so, so Kay and I were both at Space Place on Tuesday night for Jim's uh, guest speaker night. And I was the speaker. And I think that we had 10, eight or 10 members of the public and then Kay and Jim were also in the audience. And I, I would have to say that everybody was masked for the, for the whole time. It felt very comfortable and very safe to me, but I think had there been 35 or 40 people in that room, I don't know that I would have felt 
as safe as I did with 10 people in that room. Did they also live stream it, John? We did live stream it and recorded it, yeah. And I think we're all, everyone's on board on the, on the board. <laughs> we're all on the same page where we, we would like to continue uh, live streaming our meetings, even if we do return to in-person. Yeah, but I kind of agree. It's kind of it's kind of hard to come up with a robust uh, equation or criteria, you know, as far as you know, lay people like us go, as far as being health experts, um, to really kind of say, yeah, this is a green light or that's a red light, uh, you know, as far as proceeding. So, I, it's I guess it's food for thought. So uh, I want. I will say that um, we have a group that meets at Space Place. They've met there for years now. Um, called Plato, and it's for um, retired people who do different classes, and they do one at Space Place on um, Frontiers in Science, I think it's called. And they started doing um, in-person meetings again this fall. So they do it the same way. They have in-person and they also have virtual, so you can do it either way. Um, they have probably... I don't know, 30 people who are signed up for the class and probably half do it in person, half do it virtual. And I think it's, as John said, you know, we can, we've got enough room there that we can space people out. So if people feel more comfortable with taking a chair and going in the back of the room, it works fine for them. You know, they can do it in person. So just give you something to think about there. A lot of advantage it, with the uh, retired people, given the age group they're in, is the uh, vaccination rate is very high. Yeah. Uh, for the senior yes. citizens. So, uh, and especially since they're in a class about frontiers in science. It's right. Like, yeah, you know. so you, you think <laughs> yeah. probably the brighter ones. Yeah. I think. Nobody who's, that... in other words, no, nobody who's immunized. That's right. Uh... No uh, Joe Rogan followers. <laughs> <laughs> I think that. When we go back to in-person meetings, we ought to have it virtual also. Well, I agree. That gives you a wider, um, a wider possible audience. Uh, uh, you know, they could be people in other states even that can join. So uh, I, I think doing it dually is, is really a good idea. Um, admittedly, there's some inconveniences about doing dual, but um, uh, I think just having the broader reach and given the fact that some people, especially when the weather is bad, might have more trouble making it to an in-person meeting, it makes a lot of sense. Since now everybody's used to these Zoom meetings, uh, 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 you know, I, I think that keeping them going is a good idea. Everybody should remember also that Space Place is part of the university and part of Dane County. So whatever health restrictions are in place, we would have to follow whatever the university decides to do and also what Dane County does. Sure. And they seem to be very conservative in, in, in <laughs> that's about the only place they're conservative <laughs> in, uh, uh, in their approach to health. So I, I, I can't see that the, what is it, November 26th, is it that their Dane County expires? I can't see that they're going to get do away with it. So there probably still be uh, guidelines on social distancing and masking. Well, the, the problem is there's a lot of political pressure uh, that's coming from certain groups uh, about the masking. And, uh, uh, you know, mayors are, are mayors and, and uh, you know, County administrators are county administrators, and, and sometimes it's not always the science that's going to guide the decision. I don't think anyone's going to have success telling the UW athletic department to stop cramming people into the stadium at this point. So yeah. it's an example of political pressure there. Yep. So at, and at just to let you know, at Space Place, you know, we have to follow the university guidelines. So um, any we've opened up for groups coming in. So we do public programs again. Um, we have school groups coming in, but they all have to be masked when they come in. And then we disinfect everything after the group leaves. So, you know, that's just what we're doing there. Yeah. Well, thanks for your input, everyone. I think, yeah, the board can kind of continue their uh, 
we kind of have an email discussion going on. So there's lots of good food for thought and uh, we'll continue our discussion and uh, let you know of any updates. All right, and I see it is 731, uh, just a minute past where we normally start our presentation. John, do you want to introduce tonight's speaker? I would love to. Um, it is a great pleasure tonight to introduce Kay Crewald to all of you. I think a lot of you already know Kay. Um, Kay has been the Space Place um, educator specialist, outreach specialist for Kay over 25 years now. Yes, and that's amazing. Have you been there longer than Jim? No, Jim was there from the beginning, okay. from 1990. So, right. so, so Kay almost uh, beats Jim's record, but not quite. Um, if, if you guys have never seen her in action, Kay um, teaches a variety of workshops. Um, she does Saturday morning programming with kids and families. Um, if you've ever had to take a complex scientific concept and teach it to youngsters, um, you know how difficult that can be, but you also know how rewarding that can be. And Kay says she's having way too much fun to even think about retiring anytime soon. So uh, months ago- No, that's not true. I'm thinking about it. Okay. Thinking about it. <laughs> so anyway, months ago, I um, talked with Kay about doing a presentation tonight just to kind of give us some uh, insights into her world of teaching science concepts to children and families. And I'm really excited about this one because uh, I, I think it's going to be great. So everybody, please welcome Kay Crewald. And Kay, you are all set to screen share. So you can grab the screen anytime you want to. All right. Thank you, John. And thank you for inviting me. Um, I will say when John asked me to do this back in the spring, I thought, oh, yeah, you know, think about it later. I'll think about it later. And once it got closer, I got really nervous about it because I'm so used to talking to kids and not adults. So talking to a group of adults makes me super nervous. <laughs> so um, let me just give you a little background information about me. Um, I interviewed for the position at Outreach Specialist at Space Place in 1995. And I remember my interview um, when I did it with Kathy Stilberg, who was with the Space Astronomy Lab at the time. And she, you know, we talked to each other about this and the position and what we'd be doing. And she said to me, you know, all the other people who have applied for this job are graduate students in astronomy or physics. And my background was in education. So I had a teaching certification for elementary and middle school um, teaching. And she said, why would I hire somebody who's in education? And I said, you know, um, you can take somebody who's in astronomy who knows all this information, but how do they teach it to somebody who's in first grade? How do they teach it to somebody who's in third grade? How do they teach it to somebody who's in eighth grade and apply it to them so that they can understand it? So I don't know whether that was the answer that got me the job or whether it was the fact that I called her about every day afterwards to say, I really want this job. <laughs> and I don't know whether she just got tired of me calling her and finally said, okay, you can have the job or not. I think it was probably that. But I think that's, you know, part of doing outreach is knowing who your audience is. So um, let me share my screen here. Oh, now it's coming. There, is. there you go. Okay. There you go. Now got we got it. it. Ah, there you yay. <laughs> That was really freaky. That happened at the same time where I was playing with the screen share and I just scared myself. <laughs> All right, so people see it now? Yes. All right, so um, just for people who don't know, a little history about uh, Space Place. This was our old location on Park Street. It was 
an old Ponderosa building. And I always like to say to people, you know, it looked like an old Ponderosa and it smelled like an old Ponderosa. So every time I would walk in that building, you'd get this sense of, gosh, I want a steak. Um, it was a great steak. location for us. Um, we moved into our new location on, in the Villager in 2005. So it was a big upgrade for us to have a classroom space, a lecture space, and an exhibit area. We um, have our regular programs at Space Place, which we do. So every Saturday, and we've started doing these in person again uh, in September, we have Saturday science workshops for families. It's geared for children ages six to 10. And when we moved into our new location, we partnered with a couple of different groups on campus. Uh, chemistry department would do a program every Saturday. Um, the physics department would do a program on another Saturday. Biotechnology would do another program on another Saturday. And then we would have an astronomy workshop on the fourth Saturday of the month. And gradually as students in each of these departments graduated and moved on to other jobs, it came down to um, us doing the Saturday workshops. So it's not always something geared towards astronomy, but it's always a science program. So we do lots of different, very hands-on type activities. We do, um, one of our favorite ones is, you, you've been at Space Place before, so you know when you go down the stairs, you have this big stairwell that you can drop things down. So we do parachutes where we make parachutes, drop them over the stairwell, um, have eggs in there, see if the eggs can survive the drop from the stairwell, that sort of thing. So always very um, interactive. I like to have the kids do an activity and then come back and we talk about it, about what worked, what didn't work, why did it work, why didn't it work, and that sort of thing. So those are our Saturday workshops. We also have the guest presentations on the second Tuesday of each month. As John said, he just did it this past Tuesday for us. It's typically someone from the astronomy department who will talk about research that they're doing and um, sort of update on uh, what's going on in astronomy. Our party with the stars is on the third Friday of the month. And we use a soft, software program called Stellarium and talk about what you can see in the sky at that particular time. And then if the sky is clear, we have a deck up on the roof. I don't know if people know that. Um, we take telescopes out and then look at some of the things that we talk about. And then of course we have the group workshops, which we do at Space Place, which are typically school groups, um, scout groups, different programs who contact us and wanna come in for a specific workshop. We have a, on our website, we have a list of the different topics that we offer. So we do a program on um, myths and legends of the constellations. Um, we do a program on comets, comets in the classroom and phases of the moon. Um, and also living in space, which is also a very popular workshop. So groups can choose which workshop they would like to do and then come in, we do a presentation, we do a hands-on activity and kids can look around in our exhibit area. And I typically give them, a, I have a scavenger hunt um, for different grade levels with questions where they look around and have to find these answers in our exhibit area. I also wanna say if people want to jump in at any point, feel free to jump in with comments or anything as I'm going through this. Okay, I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, this is Neil. Um, have you folks ever done in the uh, in the big stairwell? Have you ever done uh, a setup with a focal pendulum? <laughs> That's a good question. 
we actually have a pendulum in our um, storage room. So one of the things we always wanted to do out there was to hang that and, you know, have it so it could be hanging in the area out there. That's one of the things we've never gotten to, but that, that's a great idea. So um, in addition to our regular programs, we get a lot of requests from groups to do other programs. And when you were mentioning the DeForest, you know, going out to the library there, that's one of the things we get a lot is from libraries and different organizations to come out and do programs. So um, here's a couple examples of some of my favorite ones. And I think the very favorite program we have ever done was called Universe in the Pasture. So the astronomy department has a program called Universe in the Park where they take telescopes out to parks all across the state of Wisconsin. They do a presentation, set up telescopes. And a lot of people hear about that and contact us to say, yeah, you know, that's, that's really interesting. We would love to do that. Can you come out to us to do the same thing? So I got a, uh, an email, this was a number of years ago, from the Hoofers Riding Club. And uh, Hoofers is a student organization through the university and they have the sailing club and different organizations. And they had a riding club that was located near Belleville, Wisconsin, out in the middle of nowhere. So it was a nice dark area. And this woman contacted me and said, you know, I look at the stars at night when I, I'm, I, I'm there early in the morning, so it's dark out. And I'm always wondering about, you know, what are the constellations? What am I looking at out there? Is there anything we could do where you could bring telescopes out to us? So I said, absolutely, we could do that. And we talked back and forth a little bit, discussed this. And what we decided to do was to go out to their location. And they wanted to, because it's a riding club, they wanted to incorporate the horses into the presentation. And so um, what we decided to do was to do a talk about constellations, what constellations are visible. But then what they did was to put uh, glow in the dark stars on their horses. So as I would talk about a constellation, they would bring a horse out with the constellation on the side of the horse. And they gave me a little thing to read about each of the horses so I could talk about what the horse, what kind of horse it was and the background on the horse and that sort of thing. And I thought, this is one of the most creative programs I think we have ever done. So what I like about it is that you're kind of incorporating not only their organization, but ours together to do a program that would be of interest to people. And they, people loved it. I mean, they absolutely just loved it. So I, I think sometimes you have to think about being creative. How can you put the two organizations together to make it work? And I think in this case, it, it worked beautifully. I mean, I, I, I actually ended up taking horseback riding lessons from them after this. They had a program called Rusty Stirrup, which is for old people um, to go out and do horseback riding lessons. So I think it's one of those where you combine what you have with what you can do and put the two together. We also have a program, we used to have a program called College for Kids, which was for, uh, it was organized through the university. It was for students going into fifth grade and that's what the picture shows you here. And what they're showing in the picture is they're actually making some uh, a scale model of the planets out of Play-Doh. So you can see the biggest planet there is Jupiter, Saturn's next to it. You get the smaller planets there on the side. And we've done the same thing with um, GPU as Grandparents University, another program that's organized through the university and uh, it's grandparents bringing their grandchildren 
and they come in for an afternoon and a morning session. We do some programs with them and it's an absolutely fabulous program. <coughs> Excuse me. Besides that, we get lots of other requests for programs. So we do the Wisconsin Science Festival, um, which just happened this past month. We opened Washburn Observatory and um, had people coming in for that. We have science expeditions, which happens in the spring and do some, uh, again, some programs with them. Lots of family science nights and that's organized sometimes through schools. So a lot of schools have uh, family science nights where they wanna bring organizations into the school to do different science activities with them. We've done some uh, programs at Space Place, partnering with um, local organizations like um, Centro Hispano, Urban League, the Goodman South Madison Library, which has been very successful because they can uh, send information out to their groups to let them know that we're doing these things. We used to do Galileo scope workshops, which were um, kits that we would put together to make telescopes called Galileo scopes. Unfortunately, Galileo scopes have lost their funding and the costs are a little prohibitive now. So we used to be able to make telescope kits with families for $20. So they could come into Space Place on a Friday night before our party with the stars, sign up for the workshop, make a telescope for $20 and have that to take home with them, which I thought was fabulous. Madison Parks are, uh, have been doing a program with us now called Learn to Stargaze. They have um, lots of different workshops that they do learn to kayak, learn to canoe, learn to do different things. And they contacted us to say, we would love to do a learn to stargaze. So it sounds similar to what the DeForest uh, library is looking for, where they want somebody to come out and talk to them about what you can see in the night sky, how can you find these things, and then maybe go out and take a look at them. And that leads to the library programs right there, which is we get lots of requests from libraries to come out and do science programs for them. <coughs> so science outreach, why should we do it? Sometimes I feel like this is what I do. <laughs> I end up with something that looks like this. Hopefully not all the time, but sometimes I feel that way. <laughs> so one of the things I thought about when I'm thinking about doing science outreach is what you got, got you interested in astronomy. So for me, it was actually not until um, I'd graduated from college. I remember going out to an observatory. I think it was it was outside Milwaukee. I think it was maybe in Waukesha. And I remember looking through a telescope. I believe it was for the opposition of Mars. It just floored me. I mean, I just thought this is fascinating. I love this. And one of the things I think about when I think about doing science outreach is this picture. This little girl who is now probably 30 years old. This was when we were at the old space place. And I don't even remember what event we were doing, but I do remember it was towards the end of the evening and I'm thinking, oh, all I wanna do is go home. I'm tired, you know, I just wanna be done with this. And this little girl looked through the telescope and I remember we were looking at Saturn. We had it pointed at Saturn. And she looked through the telescope and she looked up 
with this look of total amazement on her face. I don't think she even said anything. I think it was just the look on her face. And Jim and I looked at each other and Jim looked at me and said, this is why we do outreach. It was just, you could tell she was just flabbergasted by this. And I think that's what keeps me going. So I've been doing outreach for a lot of years. And, you know, after a certain point, you think, well, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. I'm tired of doing this. But when kids get excited about this, that's what gets me excited about it. Um, I have a couple of graduate students that work with me on Saturday mornings. And um, one of my graduate students sent me this um, article about the 95% solution. And what they're saying in this article is that 95% of what we learn about science is not learned in school. It's what we learn after school or what we learn outside of school. And when you think about it, I mean, when I think about all the shows like Nova that I watch on TV or different articles that I read, I'm learning all these things that I did not learn in school. So I think the informal learning is such a critical part of science education. So science outreach can increase public support and awareness of science. I think it leads to informed choices. So especially in the times that we're in right now of thinking of um, what's, what's the scientific support for this, and other things that you read. I think this is so critical right now. Um, informing the public on recent discoveries. So with the guest presentations that we have of people from our department coming out and talking about what's the research that they're doing, what are they learning about? I think that's important. I think Show, having a way for you to share your enthusiasm with others. So if you're enthusiastic about uh, science or astronomy, sharing that with others is great. And then I think science outreach can just be fun. I had a group of preschoolers at Space Place today. It's the best part of my day. Best hour I spent today was sharing you know, just being with them and sharing what I like and their enthusiasm for us. So um, some tips for doing science outreach. These are just things that I have come up with over the years. I'm not saying I'm an expert on this, but um, just to share what I think about what I've done in the past couple of years. So know your audience. Um, like I said, today I was talking to preschoolers, so you have to be prepared for preschoolers there. So there's some, you know, they're excited, they're moving around, that's great. Um, know who you're talking to. Is it um, somebody who's got a lot of background in astronomy, someone who doesn't have a lot of background in astronomy? and being able to adapt to who your audience is, is important. What you say is not always what your audience hears. So I wanted to include this because one of the things that really struck me was I do a workshop on comets. So I have School groups that come in will talk about comets. We make a comet using dry ice and dirt and water and a couple different things. And what I would always say to the school group is we would make this comet and I'd say, um, you know, when you discover a new comet, you get to put your name on it. So we've got a new comet here today. This comet is named after you know, such and such a school. So 
I did this. And one time this little boy raised his hand and he said, so how do you put your name on it? And I thought, what? And he said, well, you get to put your name on it. So how do you get up to the comet to put your name on it? And I thought, oh my gosh, I have been saying this same line for years. And it never dawned on me that kids are thinking, oh, you get to put your name on a comet, which means you get to actually go up to the comet and put your name on it. So now I've changed that to say, the comet is named after you. So just thinking about how you present information is you know, important. And I will repeat things uh, different, in different ways several times. So rather than saying the same thing over and over, I will rephrase it so that people can maybe get a different perception of what I'm talking about. Simple is better. I, I don't think when you talk to people that you need to um, dumb it down, but I think you need to rephrase and think about who the person is that you're talking to. Um, as I said, talking to a first grader is a lot different than talking to uh, an adult. So I will, again, rephrase things and say it differently so that people can ask questions or um, think about it maybe in a different way. And then one of the things I've found is that if I'm talking to a group and I'm enjoying myself, they're usually enjoying it too. So I try and have fun with all the groups that I have, um, especially with groups that come into space play school groups. Sometimes the teacher will, I think, read them on the riot act before they come in and say, you need to sit down, you need to be quiet, you can't say anything, you have to do this. And those are the groups I have the most hardest, the hardest time with, I will say. I love groups that are interactive, that want to ask questions, that, you know, will go back and forth with me. And I think if I'm having fun, they're having fun. And if they're having fun, I'm having fun. Also, I think excitement about science is contagious. So again, kind of to go along with the same lines, um, if I'm excited about something, the group I'm talking to is excited about something and it goes back and forth. So I love groups that I can talk back and forth with and go um, and ask questions and answer questions and just have a good time with it. So finally, um, after I talked to John last week about doing this presentation, he um, suggested that I talk a little bit about some of the workshops that we do at Space Place. <coughs> Excuse me. So one of the programs that we do is Phases of the Moon. And usually, if you're talking about Phases of the Moon, you will look at a picture like this. And you see something like this. And I've had, I told John, I've had adults that have called me and said, I don't, I, I look at the moon, I don't really understand why we see these different shapes, why we see these different phases. Could you explain it to me? And at, Space Place, um, we typically do this workshop phases of the moon for about third through fifth graders. It's about the grade level that they learn this. But you look at something like this and you think, okay, I don't understand this. <coughs> and we try and do um, a couple of different activities at Space Place to illustrate this. So rather than just showing a flat drawing like this and talking about, okay, at you know, new moon, you're looking at from the earth, 
you see the dark side of the moon. It's, it's difficult for adults to understand and really difficult for kids to understand. So we do a couple of different activities there. One of the things we have at Space Place is this, uh, I don't even know what to call it, phases of the moon demonstrator. So I took a picture of this. It's a um, foam core board, which is about three feet long by two feet wide. And I took some styrofoam balls and painted half of them to show the dark side, half of them to show the light side. So the arrows there indicate where the sunlight is coming from. So half of the moon always has sunlight on it. Half of the moon is dark. So as the moon orbits the earth, you know, half of the moon is always light, half of the moon is always dark. But depending on where we are on earth, is how you see the phases of the moon. So the center that's cut out there is meant to put your head in. So I will give these to kids and have them put their heads inside that cutout area, the white circle in the middle there. And when you do that, you're placing your head where the earth, where you would be on the earth. So, I'm going to move forward here. Here's my head in the middle here. So as I put my head in the center, I can see all the moons around me. But as I turn my head, I can see the different phases of the moon. So if I look at one side, I see a new moon there where I'm only seeing the dark side there. And as I turn it a little bit, I can see the crescent moon. So I've got a waxing crescent or waxing crescent there. And as I turn my head around, I get to, on the opposite side, a full moon or a waxing gibbous. So by putting kids in this position where they can actually see, okay, here I am on the earth looking at the moon rather than looking at it from out in space somewhere or looking at it from a picture, I can see the phases of the moon. We also have an activity where the kids make something with the phases of the moon. So again, it's similar to what we had there. So the sun is, sunlight is coming from one direction. The green circle there represents the earth. And I always tell kids, they put that paper fastener in the middle that it's the bright shiny spot on the earth. So that's where they are. They're the bright shiny spot on the earth. The pink circle there represents the orbit of the moon around the earth. And you can go through the different phases, but the key to this is you have to look at it from where you are on the earth. So you have to look at it from that paper fastener. So if you look across the paper fastener, you see the full moon over there. You move it a little, move the moon around in its orbit. If you look across from the paper fastener, you see a last quarter moon. So you see the dark half and the light half. And I'm gonna, I hope, Stop sharing my screen here. You're still sharing, Kay, but I can stop for you. Well, there you go. Sure. So can you see me now? Yep. So I have the uh, activity that we do here. So when kids come to Space Place, each student makes one of these. And as I said, you can move it around so that when you turn it, you have to turn the white side of the styrofoam ball so it faces the sunlight. But then when I look across this, I see the phase of the moon. So I think this is one of those activities where 
kids, after they practice it a little bit, actually get a sense of what the phases of the moon are and how it works. So anyway, so that's just to give you an idea of what we're doing at Space Place. And I hope, um, especially, you know, since you were mentioning doing this uh, activity at DeForest, if you're getting requests from places to go out and do um, outreach, if you would like to contact either Jim or myself at Space Place, we could give you some ideas of things to do. And I hope it encourages people to go out and do some outreach. I think it's so important. Okay, I don't know if you mentioned it or not, but um, you guys have also done a, an absolutely unbelievable job at Moon Over Monona Terrace every year where we've been in person there. I know most MAS members are stuck at their telescopes out you know, on the deck area, but over on that side where you guys do the activities, um, you had a lot of helpers from Moon Over Monona Terrace staff and volunteers and whatnot, but you guys have done um, an unbelievable, it's kind of a parallel Moon Over Monona Terrace uh, um, event. And, and I'm not sure how many MAS members know about that. Well, and thank you for bringing that up because that was one of the things I wanted to mention was, you know, Moon Over Monona Terrace is such a fabulous activity. I have had so many people come to Space Place and mention that and say, you know, I was up there and it was fabulous. It was great. And I always tell people um, if there, we get lots of people who call us to ask about buying a telescope, like what kind of telescope should I buy, which I do like go over to Moon over Monona Terrace because so many people have telescopes set up. They will talk to you about what they have, what they're doing, and you can get so much good advice there. And I will also say Misty, who organizes this at Moon over Monona Terrace, has been great about um, doing activities for kids. So to be um, very conscious of including kids in what can we do and what kind of activities can we do. I always take a telescope out there or, or, and a pair of binoculars. I like to take binoculars out there for kids. And just to say, you know, have fun. Here's a, here's a telescope. You can do whatever you want to with it. I'll show you how to use it. I'll show you how to move it around and give them the opportunity to do that. So I think Moon Over Monona Terrace is just incredible. I, I, I always tell people when it's a, a warm night and clear, it's fabulous with the number of people that you get out there for that. Hey, I was curious about the uh, Galileo scope. What sort of feedback did you get from the kids who ended up getting those? That's a good question. We started doing um, surveys with that as far as, um, you know, are you still using it? Do you still take it out? And it kind of fell off my charts there. But um, we probably, gosh, I'm trying to think of how many Galileo scopes we've actually made with people. What I always wanted to do was to have another event where we would say, if you built a Galileo scope, bring it out to the park that night and see how many people came out with that. But I think it's, I, I think it was successful with people getting out and using it. Um, it's hard to tell how many people, you know, years afterwards, still take it out. But for the price that, it, that we were selling it at, I mean, we were selling it at cost, basically. And, um, you know, even to get people out for a couple times using it, I think was, was, was good. Okay, because you've been inspiring a generation of young people now, I was wondering, do you ever hear back from any of the kids who showed up for workshops now that they're teenagers or adults or college students? And what are their memories they share with you? 
I do. I don't hear so much from the students, but I hear from the parents. So I will have parents that come back to Space Place and say, you know, I came here with my son or daughter for Saturday workshops, and now they're working at, you know, NASA or someplace. And I think it's because of the Saturday workshops that you did with them that inspired them. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I love that. You know, it just makes you feel so good to mm -hmm. think that maybe you had an effect on somebody somewhere along the way. You never know when things like that will happen. I remember uh, several months ago reading a story in the newspaper about uh, some science fiction writer who, you know, was, he was writing for a successful show on Netflix, some science fiction show on Netflix. And he said, yeah, what got me going on science and space was the planetarium at Memorial High School in Madison. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's neat. So you just never know who you reach sometimes and what they might do later in life. Very true. Does anybody else have any more questions for Kay? Well, I guess not. So, yeah, thank you so much, Kay. I mean, this is a really, for me, it's been a really great and uh, uh, a very, uh, inspiring a presentation I, I you know like i myself uh, you know occasionally we get requests from people like whether it's the the library a local library or, or uh, someone who wants to I, just this last fall i gave a presentation to some uh, school kids at uh, devil's lake um and it's always kind of tricky to figure out how to go about doing these things but yeah you know you get the impact you make sometimes you just it's very rewarding and keeps everybody young and fresh and i think kind of tell a story of my own sometimes it's also fun to see a grown adult turn into a five-year-old sometimes <laughs> you see that too so yeah these moments these are moments just are... Think, things that add positive things to everybody's uh uh, uh, you know, experience in life, and it's so worth doing. So, thank you so much for uh, such a long career of devotion to this, Kay, and great well, thank presentation. You. Thank you for inviting me to do the presentation. Like I said, I was super nervous about doing this. I'm like, oh, what am I going to talk about? But, um, you know, I think yeah, it's gotta, what I, like I said, share your enthusiasm. All kids at heart. <laughs> yeah. I think I got into a situation where I was trying to explain to a uh, sixth grade kids uh you know what parallax is and i wish i had thought of it at the time but i'm like gal if you stick your finger right here close one eye close the other eye see how that moves the finger moves back and forth. i just wish i'd thought of that at the time but i found yeah. sometimes it you, you take sometimes you take a concept like that that you take so for granted you know that's easy to understand but it really is a you know like you were saying with the phases of the moon it's easy to take stuff like that for granted so when i, thank you when, so I was much. A, when i was a little kid and had got my first telescope i can't remember what it was my brother had it until a couple of years ago this is back in the 50s um the big thing back then was was uh observing the moons of jupiter and timing them <laughs> and in fact i still have a notebook that my dad had he used the telescope to do that and his observations of the moons and his hand drawings of them. It, it, and it's always remained with me as, as something to do. That seems to have fallen a bit out of uh, common, well, people don't seem to do that very much anymore, but there, there are little things like that that can show you the dynamism of the night also, if you do that over, over several nights. And watch those little dots, those four little dots move with respect to Jupiter. I you know, always do that. Do we have the software program we, we use, Delarium. Um, I'll do that with school groups. You know, I'll say, you know, Jupiter is visible right now, and we'll zoom in on it. And I'll say, look at where those dots are. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to go ahead a day and look at where the dots are now. And we'll go ahead another day and look at where the dots are now. And I said, you can do this. You know, if you have binoculars at home, take your binoculars out, look at Jupiter and draw these. You know, you can do it, draw it every night and try it. Whether they do or not, I don't know, but you know, that's something I think is, is incredible.